welcome to this special webinar, Protecting Yourself from Fraud. My name is C.J. Alexander, and I'm a Client Services Group Manager here at Fisher Investments. I'm joined today by Vice President Naj Srinivas. Hello, everyone. Hello, Seji. So let's start off today's presentation by just taking a look at the agenda for the day. We want to start off today's presentation by taking a look at why this is important, who's impacted by it, how you might identify different scams and fraud, what some popular scams are right now. We'll then move on to how you can actually protect yourself from potential fraud or scams. Let's start out by why is this important? Well, the simple reason is this, is that as more and more people put their information as online, as people are using more things like apps or websites, as people are using their smartphones more and more, your information is out there, whether it's your personal, personally identifiable information like your name, your phone number, or your address, or things more sensitive like your credit card information or social security number. So here's just a statistic that we found that's a little alarming in fact, but there's over 9 billion data records that have been lost or stolen since 2013, and only a small fraction of those have actually been reported to be stolen or reported as stolen and therefore made unusable by those people who out there who might have it, might be selling it, say, on the dark web or elsewhere on the internet. So it's becoming more and more prevalent today as we're using more information online. Likewise, as evildoers or those nefarious types out there in the world are, are getting more sophisticated in their attempts to get this information from all of us. So here's just a, another look at, that was data breaches. Here's a different look at, at potential fraud. This is identity theft and fraud complaints, a similar but related topic. So as you can see is here, over time, you've had more and more people report fraud complaints, other consumer complaints in general related to identity, and then also identity theft complaints. So it's something to be aware of that as we're using more information online, the propensity for that information to be leaked out or for others to get a hold of it and misuse it is going up over time. Here's another way to just take a look at that. This is just going back into 2017, but these are companies that reported that they had data breaches or customers' information was compromised last year in 2017. So if you shopped at any of these or made purchases at any of these companies in the last year, it's likely that some or all of your information that you may have shared with them was actually compromised out there in the world. So something to consider. And we'll spend a good deal of time in today's presentation talking about how you protect yourself from breaches like this, how you protect your, your credit information when it might have been exposed as well. So bear with us here as we go through that. So I want to talk a little bit about who's impacted. Who are people that are being targeted? And you might think that it's one group or the other, but in fact, the reality is that across the population spectrum, if you've got sensitive information out there, whether you're retired or you're working, even if you have children or even if you're pretty young, it's, it's possible that your information is out there in the world. One of the factors that many people don't consider is that if your information is stolen, you might not actually see it be used right away. Many times what happens with hackers or evildoers for this information is that they go ahead and they buy the information, but then they hold on to it for, say, several years at a time. So if you have a child or a grandchild, for example, their information may actually be out there, but you may not see any negative activity as a result of it. Even if your information was compromised, you may not see any negative activity right away as a result of it being compromised. It may take several years for you to actually see it happen to you. So again, we'll talk about how you protect yourself in a moment. But here's just, to take a look, here's just a look at that data. So overwhelmingly, you've got people who are over 60 years old, 59, 50 to 59, who have the most amount of losses and the most amount of complaints. And if you just think about that for a moment, it's generally people in these age ranges who also have the most amount of money, the most credit history. So they end up being very valuable targets for hackers and people are trying to get that information. So something to keep in mind is that while it can affect everybody, it overwhelmingly and disproportionately impacts those people between the ages of 50 and over 60. Now, here's just some things to consider if you're a baby boomer or even older and why, they, why you should be especially aware of fraud schemes. Well, generally speaking, as I mentioned, they're financially established and they make attractive targets as a result. 
they tend to be more polite and trusting of people who are on the phone or people who approach them in public for different things. They're also less likely to report fraud or provide enough detailed information to investigators. Oftentimes, people who have been the victims of fraud feel embarrassed about it, don't want to report it to family and friends, don't want to let them know about it, don't want to provide investigators with the insight. They'd rather just kind of brush it under the rug and kind of go on with their lives and try to be more vigilant next time. Likewise, people in this category are often more interested and susceptible to not only health-related product offerings, but things to do with retirement, how to navigate things like Medicare, as I'll, I'll share with you in a couple minutes here. But there's a lot of offers out there in the world that appeal to this group because of those factors. And they try to create fraud or create scams that directly appeal to those folks in this category who might be retired, might be baby boomers, especially the senior citizens and, and the elderly who might not be so discerning of potential fraud. As I mentioned earlier, you ought to be aware of fraud against millennials and children as well. Although they are, they generally speaking don't have as much wealth accumulated, they could be in the accumulation phases of their lives and that makes them potential targets as well. But later on, later on and down the road, if their information has been compromised, it could also be used by hackers as well. Generally speaking, millennials and children are less aware of basic security habits. They tend to be more cavalier with online credentials, the information that they share on social media. A lot of times you'll see millennials and other children, and I'll share with you in a moment why this is important, share where they are or what they're doing on social media. And that's actually really important information to hackers to get a hold of. And I'll share with you a scam here in a couple minutes where hackers are using this type of information to prey on the grandparents or parents of children. Likewise, if you think about millennials and children, they're more likely and susceptible to using public or unsecured Wi-Fi networks, which are very, very easily, comprom very easily compromised. Likewise, using unverified third-party apps. So very similar to... to Retired folks and the baby boomers, there's lots of different reasons why millennials and children need to also be aware of these fraud schemes. And these are just some things to think of and ways you can help protect your, your children or their children from these types of fraud. So next I want to share with you just some helpful tips on how to identify a scam or fraud out there in the world. There's different steps that you can take, and generally speaking, they all fall into these categories. Three categories. Generally speaking, a scam or fraud is pretty unexpected. For example, a company might contact you for personal information they should already have. For example, a company might contact you to, on the phone to verify your credit card number. Say it's your utility company, you've already set up that information online, or, or you pay it online yourself every month. A company might contact you and say, we want to verify this payment that you made. Generally speaking, most companies will either get your payment or they'll send you a written notice that they didn't get your payment in the mail. They'll very, very infrequently say, call you on the phone, or send you an email, as I'll share with you here in a moment. Another way that you can detect a scam or fraud is that it's unsolicited. For example, you receive an email sent to various but unrelated email addresses. Say you've got a golf club, and your, your golf buddies in your golf club, all of your email addresses are listed on the golf, golf club's website. Well, some hackers could actually see that, see that you're a member of a golf club, and actually take all of your email addresses and put them in a group with another bunch of people they find and send you a note and purport to be someone you actually know in the golf club or someone representing the golf club, and they're asking you to do something. That's a generally a warning sign. If you see a bunch of email addresses, you don't know necessarily how everyone's related, you don't know who the sender is, in fact, and they're not properly identifying themselves, that should set off a warning bell for you. Last but not least, generally speaking, they're asking you to do something, especially urgently, urgently, asking you to run a program, click a link, direct you to a website, or, as I'll show you in a couple minutes here, asking you to urgently send them money somewhere, generally by a moneygram or a telegram, never really something that's traceable or retractable. So just keep that in mind. These are the three basic characteristics of scams and fraud. They're generally unexpected they're unsolicited, and they're asking you to do something, often urgently. And there's, generally speaking, some repercussions tied to them asking you urgently. For example, if you don't do this right away, the IRS is going to contact you, or we're going to send you to jail, those types of things. 
So here's an example of something seemingly official. It looks like it's coming from the IRS, but it's unexpected and asks you to do something. Email looks like it's coming from the IRS. There you see the irs.gov email address. But keep in mind, many people have the ability to spoof email addresses. So even if it seems like it's coming from the right place, it might not actually be. But then too, just take a look at the body of the email as well. It says it's coming from the IRS. It says it's come to our attention. You owe back taxes for the calendar year 2016. Please download and view the complaint at the following URL. Again, unexpected, asking you to do something. But then if you look at the link that they're providing, the link itself seems like it's going to the IRS's website. But if you just hover your mouse over the link, just hover, don't click, but hover over it, you'll see it's actually going to a Russian website. So that's another way that you can tell that this is a potential fraud or scam. Now, last but not least, another important thing to keep in mind, and IRS scams are increasingly popular. But another thing to keep in mind with the IRS is that if indeed you owe back taxes to the IRS, they will never send you an email. They will always communicate with you through written correspondence to your home address or whatever address that you do correspondence with the IRS. They will almost never send you an email itself. They'll never call you on the phone either. It's always going to be written correspondence. So keep that in mind. It's another way that you can tell or potential scams or fraud. Here's another example, website P PC scams. How many of you have gone to a website, you've, you've looked around, you click on something, or all of a sudden a pop-up opens up that says, from the website that says, your PC is infected, click here to run a virus scan. But it's not actually from the virus scan that you have installed on your computer. It's from the website itself. Again, this is unexpected, it's unsolicited, and asking you to do something. And generally speaking, when you click on that, what it does is it runs a script on your computer and generally can infect it. So whenever you see these things, the best thing to do is to click out of them. Click the X box on the far right-hand corner of the screen. If you're running a Windows PC, you can hit Control-Alt-Delete. Use the task manager to actually end the program and exit out of it as well. That's another way. And then, of course, you probably shouldn't go back to that website again. That's another key here. Likewise, as I'll show you here in a moment, or talk to you about in a moment, it's important to really keep antivirus software, internet security software installed on your computer and up to date. That'll help you really ensure that if you have run into these situations in the past, they can scan for them and potentially remove them for you. Here's another good example. Here's an example from seemingly coming from Amazon.com, but just take a look at the email address from the from line there. It's not from someone at actually Amazon.com. So that's a good hint to you that that's probably not active or accurate and actually from Amazon.com. Again, it's unexpected and also ask you to do something. They're asking you to actually take a look at, is this you, is this your identity, and click on something. Now, there are certain instances where you may actually have someone who tries to get into your account and an Amazon.com or a Google or a Facebook will email you and say, hey, we see that someone has tried to click on your account. Please log into your account to change it. And so what I recommend that you do, though, if you do get anything from an Amazon or a Facebook and it's asking you to actually verify your identity, don't click on the link in the email. Actually go to Amazon.com and try to log in yourself. If you found that your password is being changed or something like that, reset your password. It's important to note, though, that many times what these hackers will do is they'll actually infiltrate your email address, your primary email address. So it's important to set up what's called two-factor authentication. And I'll, I'll, re I'll share that with you in a moment here. And also set up a backup email address so that if you lose access to that first email address, you have a backup one and can reset that password. But moral of the story here is, Never click on the link in the email that's asking you to identify your, to verify your identity. Always go to, say, the Amazons of the world or the Google.com or the Facebook or whatever else it is and try logging in there to verify your identity. That's a good way to actually, in fact, ensure if you're, someone was trying to compromise your identity or if this is a scam or a phishing attack. 
So what are some popular scams right now out there in the world? Let's just cover these. These are scams that have been identified by the AARP and other organizations that we wanted to share with you. They're becoming increasingly popular and people are increasingly more susceptible to it. So we wanted to share the scams with you, how they work, and then how you can protect yourself or what you can do if someone actually calls you or, or reaches out to you trying to report one of these upon you. So here are the three scams. There's a grandparent scam, there's a Medicare scam, and there's a charity scam. Let's start with the grandparent scam. Usually speaking, the way this scam works is someone either pretending to be your grandchild or a friend of your grandchild or, say, even the police that have your grandchild or your child in custody, they may claim that he or she is in trouble. And they ask you to send them money or wire them money immediately with an emotional plea, something like, please don't tell mom and dad. Generally speaking, what they're trying to do here, and I should also add that they'll usually do this via email, but sometimes they'll even do it over the phone. Sometimes they can do it via text message, but we've actually seen instances where they do this over the phone. And of course, you as a grandparent, you care about your, your grandchildren, and you really don't want them to be in trouble. So this is a very scary thing. And according to the FTC, $328 million was lost to grandparent scams in 2017. So it's a pretty frightening thing. Here's some things that you can do to protect yourself. First of all, don't panic. Slow down and verify the person's identity. If they purport to be actually a member of your family, ask them some questions about themselves or something that wouldn't be readily apparent online or via social media. A moment ago, I mentioned that millennials and children tend to share too much information on social media. Well, this is a way that hackers and scammers actually use that information online. Say your grandchildren's traveling to a foreign country or traveling to a different state. People may see that online, that this person is here. They may see that you're actually related to this person as well. They may find your information, your phone number online and contacting, contact you and use all of this information. They're building trust and confidence in you in that way. So slow down, try to verify the person's identity. One thing that you can actually do with your family, if you're worried about this type of thing, is develop a code word or develop some phrase that they can use that you know that's not overly obvious, that you know this is actually the person. For example, you can ask them a question about their vacation and what they ate. And if they already know that this is the code word and the, the code word should be, well, I had a great pizza, whatever it is, that's a sign to you that this is actually your grandchildren or your child. And so you can think of different ways that you can actually identify a person's identity that way, but usually you want to share those with your family as well. Get off the phone if you don't suspect that it's actually a member of your family call the family member's phone or call the parents of the family member. Call someone else to verify that they are actually indeed where they purport to be or that they're in trouble. Do not wire any money. That is what most of these scammers want to do. What they try to do is keep you on the phone as long as they possibly can and have you wire the money. Sometimes they'll have you hang up and they'll say, call me back in 15 minutes and verify that you've wired the money. Now, if you've already wired money, you've already been a victim of one of these scams, what you can do is you can try canceling the transaction by calling these wire services, MoneyGram or Western Union, and then you want to file a police complaint or a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. Now, many times when these wires have already gone through, they're very difficult to cancel, and that's one of the reasons scammers use MoneyGram and Western Union, because they're difficult to cancel, especially after if too much time has gone by. So keep that in mind. And also follow the previous three steps up so you don't get into this situation. And then last but not least, increase the privacy settings on your own social media accounts and ask your family members to increase the privacy settings on theirs so that people they don't know can't access things like their location or who you're related to or who they're related to as well. And that's a way that you can protect sort of your information and the information of your family and loved ones from these scammers getting a hold of it and using it against you. Now here's another scam. This is the Medicare card replacement scam. Fraudsters posing as a Medicare representative will contact you regarding Medicare replacement card, the replacement card program starting in May 2018. And they'll ask you to do something very urgently, like verify your social security number as a prerequisite for getting a new card, or request your bank information to process refunds from transactions on your old card. 
and just take a look there. Unsolicited, you weren't expecting it, and urgently asking you to do something. The fact of the matter is, though, Medicare, similar to the IRS, will never ask you for a bank account number, and no refunds are generally owed as a result of it. Likewise, they'll never contact you and ask you to verify your Social Security number over the phone. This is something that not only Medicare and the IRS, but also other organizations and institutions are becoming more and more aware of is that people do not want to share their Social Security number over the phone. And so many people are transitioning away from this. Some institutions may still just use the last four digits of your Social Security number to identify, them, identify you. What I would encourage you to do is if, if you have an institution that is still trying to use the last four digits of your Social Security number, see if they have alternative authentication methods to verify your identity and rely on those instead because they're going to be a lot more secure and it exposes your Social Security number less out there in the world. Now here's another one, the charity scam. Criminals may take advantage of your generosity by impersonating charities through the phone, over social media, over email, or even in person. And now that's not to say that everyone who's out there in the world that goes door to door or you encounter on the street is in fact a criminal trying to take advantage of your information, but you want to be really, really skeptical of them and you want to make sure that you're not handing over too much information or even doing things like writing a check in person that might they might be able to use. Checks are some of the most unsecure ways that you can actually pay for things, as I'll point out to you here in a couple minutes here. Now, the scammer will also use high pressure, sometimes emotional-based pitches, requesting cash, wire, or check donations. So again, they're asking you to urgently do something. Here are some common charity scams, solicitations for veterans or military families, Fundraisers calling on behalf of police, firefighters, or other benevolent societies like the American Red Cross, or charities related to recent natural disasters, especially those in your area. It's a very, very popular scam. Anytime there's a big headline grabbing news story out there in the world that, you know, is very tragic from a human cost, there are scammers out there in the world trying to take advantage of it. Now, thankfully, there's a lot of do do-gooders out there in the world that are, are trying to do well out there as well, but just be aware that there are also people out there in the world who are trying to steal your information and get money out of it as a result. So here's some things that you can do to protect yourself from this scam. If you want to make a charitable donation, approach the charity organization directly to make the donation. So for example, if you want to make a donation to the Red Cross, approach the Red Cross's website directly or look at their phone number online and call it go to them directly. Don't use an intermediary to do so. If you have an intermediary, you encounter someone, say, on the street that wants you to donate money, take their information from them, take whatever they're handing out and say, you know what, I will go ahead and get in touch. Thank you very much for the information. I'll reach out to whatever this website is or charity is. But before you do so, what you want to do is check the organization's name with the Better Business Bureau's Wise Giving Alliance, other organizations like Charity Navigator, Charity Watch, or GuideStar. And that's just a couple ways, a couple websites that authenticate charities and they can make sure that it's trustworthy, especially if it's not a big brand name charity or organization like the Red Cross, the Make-A-Wish Foundations, things that you see out there in the news every day and on a regular basis. You want to check those smaller organizations with one of these sites. And then last but not least, as I mentioned earlier, never send money or give personal information without verification. Likewise, things like checks that has a lot of your personal information on it, your name, your address, your bank account number, remember that's on the bottom of the actual check, and your signature. Those are all very, very sensitive things and easy, to, easy for scammers and fraudsters to use online or otherwise. So what can you do if you've, in fact, you believe that your information has actually been compromised online? How can you better protect yourself? Well, here are some things that we put together that are safeguards against your identity being not only stolen, but then also protecting it, that information from being misused if it's already out there in the world. So the number one thing that you can do is review credit reports and your accounts online. Consider freezing your credit or putting a fraud alert on your credit. And I'll explain what the difference is here in a moment. Find an ID theft protection service out there in the world that can 
at least add another layer of protection for you. And if your identity is compromised or information has already been misused, can help you really unravel some of that and solve some of it for you. And then we'll give you some steps to take if your identity has in fact been stolen. So let's start with reviewing your credit reports and accounts. If you go to annualcreditreport.com, you can get a copy of your credit report for free every 12 months. I want to caution you here though. There are other sites out there in the world that sound a lot like annualcreditreport.com, but are not actually the federal government's authorized site. Annualcreditreport.com was authorized by the federal government and the three reporting agencies actually use this site to provide you that copy of your credit report for free every 12 months. If you've actually already used this site once in the last 12 months, you can actually go to each of the individual bureaus and there are Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. These are what's known as the big three credit bureaus out there in the world. There are actually a lot of different credit bureaus out there, but these are the really, really big ones that most, most organizations use to check an individual's credit. So you can actually go to any one of those and, and for a small fee within the 12 month window, get a copy of your credit report. And what you wanna do is go through that credit report with a fine tooth comb. Take a look at every account on there. Is it an account that you remember? Is there a name that you remember on there? What's the balance on these accounts? Are there any fraudulent activities or things on there that you might not recognize right away? Accounts you didn't open, for example, or balances that may in fact be way too high relative to what you remember spending on them. And if you do see any fraudulent activity, you wanna report that to any of the one credit reporting agencies right away. And that's what's called a fraud alert. Now that's if you actually suspect fraud. If you suspect inaccuracies, you can also report them to the credit reporting agency that has that inaccurate information and they'll look into it for you. But let's go into what the difference is between a fraud alert and a credit freeze now for a moment. A fraud alert statement is a temporary freeze of your credit. It is done at no cost to you and you can actually contact any one of the three credit reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion, and if you tell one of them that you suspect some fraud on your account, they'll actually freeze your credit for 90 days at each of the three reporting agencies for you, again, at no cost at all whatsoever to you. However, remember, this is really temporary in nature. So really, the gold standard for protecting your credit from unauthorized use, in my opinion, and a lot of experts' opinions, is the credit freeze. A credit freeze permanently freezes your credit until you call in and remove it. Now, the credit reporting agencies generally charge you $5 to place a freeze on your account or remove a freeze on your account, and importantly, you actually have to call each of the different agencies independently to put a freeze. Unlike the fraud alert statement where you call one and they report it to the others, with the credit freeze, you've got to actually call each of them independently and put that freeze on it. And this actually speaks a little bit to the motivations of the credit reporting agencies. The credit reporting agencies, they're really not in the business of serving you as a customer. In fact, they're in the business of selling your information to people out there in the world or businesses out there in the world are interested in checking your credit. That's who their customer really is. And so it behooves them to not make it very easy for you to freeze your credit and that's why they do it in this way. However, as I mentioned a moment ago, this is really the gold standard to protecting yourself. Now, it does create complications because obviously checking your credit is important to a lot of different things. But it's very easy to actually get around this. For example, Say you want to sign up for a new cable TV service. There's a credit check that's associated with it. It's pretty easy for you to ask, well, are you going to check my credit? Which agency do you check it with? And if they give you the agency, which they generally will, before you actually sign up for the service, just go ahead and call Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion, whichever one it is, remove the credit freeze from your account, and then apply for that new cable TV service. Or if you're applying for a home loan or a car loan or any other thing, just find out which agency they're using and unfreeze the credit. And after that loan is processed and goes through, you can place that freeze back on your credit. Again, I know that's, that's work that you have to do, but this is how the credit reporting agencies really work. 
Now, the next step really is if you can find an ID theft protection service. And there are a lot of ID protection theft services out there in the world. When we did research on this, we identified hundreds with a number of different features out there in the world. So you really have to look into these on your own, do a little research, figure out what's appropriate to you and what has the features that you want. Here are just some examples of them. The big three offer ID theft protection services and you can go through them if you like. Equifax is what they call Trusted ID Premier. That runs a cost of about $16.99 a month. However, if your information was actually compromised as a result of the Equifax breach, they're actually providing you that service for a year or two at no cost to you. So it's something that you want to look into if you're impacted by last year's Equifax breach or not. Experian CreditWorks, they've got a, a, a program that's $4.99 a month and $24.99 a month thereafter. TransUnion has their own. LifeLock is another popular one. If you're a AAA member, they have theirs. Costco, if you remember there, they have theirs as well. And again, the features on these vary quite dramatically. Some are just credit monitoring. Some are actually identity monitoring. Some also help you in instances where, say, for example, if your social media account gets compromised and you lose access to it, a representative from some of these services can actually help get in touch with, say, a Facebook or an Instagram to get control of your social media account again. Um, you know, that might not be of interest to many of you, but if you're, say, President Trump, you might be more interested in getting control of your Twitter account again. So you have to really do research into these types of things to figure out what's most appropriate for you because there's a lot of different options out there. And I'll also mention to you that they're, they're not all foolproof. You could spend this money and you st your information could still be compromised out there in the world. It adds a layer of protection and it adds a service to you to regain control of your identity if in fact it's been stolen. For example, many of them provide up to a million dollars in legal fees if your information has been actually stolen and compromised. So that's really why you want to try to use one of these or look into these if you're interested. Now, what, a, what can you do if your identity has in fact been stolen? Well, first and foremost, you can either file a fraud alert statement with any one of the credit reporting agencies, the big three. You can also freeze your credit, which I highly recommend all of you do just as a pro proactive safeguard measure. You can investigate an ID theft recovery service, which may actually help you with any problems that you encounter. You also want to report the ID theft to the Federal Trade Commission at identitytheft.gov. And then last but not least, you may also want to contact your local law enforcement and your state attorney general, file a complaint, let them know exactly what happened. Many times a police report can be useful, especially if cards have been opened up in your name, credit cards have been opened up in your name and misused. You can provide the police report to the credit reporting agencies to show them, hey, look, this wasn't me. I've reported this to local law enforcement. Here's, here's a police uh, report that shows as much. So th that can be helpful for you to follow through on if your, report, if your identity in, has indeed been stolen. Now, here's some other tips to protect yourself. And, and I, I know I'm sharing a lot of information with you here today. I'll just reiterate one thing. No need to take furious notes on this presentation if you are already. Um, we'll provide an archive copy of it for you to review later on or provide to family and friends. And if you want a copy of the slides in today's presentation, just ask your investment counselor for a copy and they'd be happy to get one over to you. So here's some other tips to protect yourself. Passwords. You want to use passwords that are longer and more secure. There was really once upon a time a view that if you used alphanumeric or you combined things like numbers and letters, that might be secure. For example, you might do pizza 22 and that was a very secure password. Well, these days, security experts have actually said that that's no longer really as powerful as, say, a phrase that actually has numbers and letters interspersed between it. So you'll see an example on your screen there, April showers bring May flowers with ones and zeros interspersed for different letters within it. Another thing that you want to do, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is set up what's called multi-factor authentication. And multi-factor multi -factor authentication is really just a security system that requires more than one method of authentication for you to get into an account or make big changes to an account. For example, say you go into your bank account and you want to change the password online for your bank account. Your banking institution, if you have multi-factor authentication set up, will require you to not only put in your current password, 
but they'll also send you a number to your cell phone via text message or via email, whatever you set up for them, something else outside of the actual system you're using. And they'll say, well, we just sent you a message to whatever, you, whatever system you preferred. Please enter in that security key or that token for us, and then we'll proceed with this. So it's just an additional layer of security that you can utilize. And if you have a service that you're using or an online service, I highly recommend that you look into multi-factor authentication and turn this on. It's another way that you can protect your information, especially against those people who might steal or get into and hack, say, your email account, and then try to get into other things like your bank account. You also want to set up things like account alerts for activity. So this would be especially useful for credit cards or your bank account. Set up an email alert, a text alert to notify you anytime, say, activity is, you have activity in your account over $100. And that way, if too much, too much activity can't go by without you noticing it, if someone indeed has compromised your information. Say you're out and you spend more than $100, that's fine, you're aware of it, you get a notification. But if you're not out and you're sitting at home and you see something go through that you weren't aware of, well, at least your bank account is letting you know and you can pick up the phone and call them very quickly and report that fraudulent activity. The other thing that you want to do is keep your operating system of your computer the antivirus software you have installed and your firewall software all up to date. So these are pieces of software like Windows, for example, if you're using a PC or your Mac OS, um, your antivirus software, whether it's a McAfee or a Norton Internet Security. You want to make sure that these are up to date. Run those antivirus definitions as frequently as you can or download new software to protect you. It's, it's again, not going to be foolproof in protecting you against people trying to potentially hack your computer, but at least it's an additional layer of security. And I mentioned this a moment ago, if at all possible, avoid using physical checks. Always use credit cards wherever possible. If you want to rank order the security of different payment methods, the credit card is generally speaking going to be the most secure method that you can use to pay for anything. Credit cards, and not debit cards, mind you, credit cards, generally speaking, come with a lot of protections against fraudulent activity. And if you notify them that you have some fraudulent activity on the card, generally speaking, you're not liable for any of that fraudulent activity, but you have to notify them that it's happening. With a debit card, if too much time goes by and you see that fraudulent activity, you could be liable for the entire amount of whatever fraudulent activity is on your debit card. And then check, checking, account, or checking accounts and using checks, those are the least secure of all payment methods out there, generally speaking, because they have a lot of your information, your name, your address. Sometimes they take your phone number down as well. If you remember back, say, 15 years ago or 10 years ago, many merchants, if they're taking a check from you, also wrote down your driver's license number on the check. Some of you probably remember that. They've got your signature and your bank account information on the bottom there. So you want to try to avoid using those at all, if at all possible. Here's just a little quick graphic of some commonly used passwords I'd share with you. These are the 500 most commonly used passwords out there on the internet. So if you see your password on here, please change it. Try to use a, a passphrase and intersperse numbers and letters in it as well. Thank you so much, Naj. Well, folks, that's all we have time for today. Thank you for joining us for this Fisher Investments webinar.